a couple of days ago, you guys must have seen um, some pretty cool news from us on Twitter in terms of being able to scale out a stable diffusion API to 1,000 concurrent users. We want to talk to you a little bit about how we did that because for us, like the name of the game is being able to scale, being able to do it at a performant level and being able to do so securely and cost effectively. So we want to tell you a little bit about how we went about doing this. And then Sharon is going to show you a lot more about how we actually went about doing this. Before we get started, just some quick introductions from Sharon and I. Um, we'll jump to the next slide, Sharon. My name is Neil. I've been at Lightning AI for, what is it, almost three months. So pretty young in dog years as far as things go. Um, but I've been building AI and ML products for almost 10 years. Super enthusiastic about it. And I spend a lot of my time reading and consuming content about AI and machine learning. I'm probably too active for my own good. Any sport that you think is dangerous and probably is going to kill you, I can say that's probably one of my top sports. Um, skiing, biking, gets much worse from there. So I'll stop for those of you who have kids and get kind of anxious about activities like that. And then finally, I've got a beautiful little dog. She's sleeping over here, has no worries in the world. Um, but hey, that's the benefit of being a, a dog in this, in this time and age. Um, hello, people. This is Sharon, um, senior software engineer uh, in the AI product team at Lightning. Um, I'm probably a veteran at Lightning. It's been, I don't know, two plus years. Yeah, two plus years. Um, I wrote the hands on deep learning in PyTorch, it's probably one of the first book in PyTorch. Um, I, before this, before Lightning Gig, I was at TensorWork, acquired by Lightning. Um, and part of uh, TensorWork um, was part of the Redis AI team. Uh, where we're building deep learning deployment solution on top of Redis with all the goodies from Redis. Uh, before that, few other small gigs um, right now, uh, zooming in from Bangalore, India. All right. Well, let's get to uh, a poll just to get us started. You guys have already done such a great job with the chat. Let's see if we can do the same with the poll. So we want to get to know you guys a little bit better. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to pull up a poll right now. And really what we want to understand is like, what do you associate most with? What, what is your sort of profession or what brings you to, um, you know, to most machine learning forums or why are you most curious about the topic that we're going to talk about today? So which of these do you most associate with? Is it contributing to open source projects on your own time? Do you work for a major corporation as an engineer or a data engineer? Do you have your own product idea or you've already built the product and you're trying to apply your learnings to it? research, trying to apply this to your academic work, or something else, none of the above. Let us know. We'll keep it open for about 30 seconds. Sharon, when you first got it, when you first got started, which of these applied most to you? Uh, probably the first one. Um, yeah, I was, I was at a very small company doing small things, so I started to contribute to open source stuff. Um, yeah and got into like um, a company that did not have an AI team from there, go to another company, then to TensorWork. Okay, interesting. It seems like that's a really popular way to get started, especially in machine learning is contributing to open source projects. And then you sort of, that's your on-ramp into professional roles or academic roles, whatever, whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah, you don't really see how um, how rewarding the open source projects are sometimes. Very cool, very cool. Well, I'm sure we've got most answers at this point in time. So let's um, let's jump in. I don't know, can we, can we see the results or are we going to sort of, oh, magical Zoom? All right, so half of you work for a corporation. You're trying to take some of these learnings to work. That's awesome. So they've kind of almost gotten past that first open source pump and into, into making it their, their full-time gig. And it looks like we've got about a quarter of the group that are contributing to open source projects. I'm sure this is a, a bit of an and statement um, between the corporation and the open source thing. And then some people with product ideas. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, hopefully we can show you guys how to make things a little bit better. Let's jump into the presentation and the prepared content. So guys, we're here to talk about scaling an AI application or an API. And we all know that this is challenging to do. Just a little bit more on sort of why we've found it challenging in the past at Lightning. Um, it's for the following reasons. Next slide. The first and sort of the most important one is maintaining availability. 
whether that's provisioning servers, finding the type of server that you're actually after, knowing which one to have. We've gotten these questions numerous, numerous times. It's challenging, it's complex. There's a lot of different options. And so getting past that first step, that friction out of the gates, it can be challenging. But in addition to that, once you have provisioned those servers, once you know what you're after, you wanna make sure that everything is secure. You don't want miners attacking your API and driving up your server or your spend. You don't want someone who shouldn't be accessing it, getting access to your sort of end product or the model you're using, whether it's proprietary or whether it's paid for. And for a number of other reasons, security can be a real challenge. The next big issue that we always hear about is volatility. Whether that's a big burst in requests that you have over the course of a minute, because we know that it's not evenly distributed throughout the day, or if there is for some reason a need to increase the number of servers that you have or decrease them, which happens because typically during the day, your, you know, your request volume isn't um, steadily uh, sort of spread across the day. You'll have more throughout the morning and the afternoon, perhaps, and then it'll dip off at the end of the day. So having servers running all day, super costly. Another one that we hear really often is batching. And this is the thing that we're actually considering having an entirely separate webinar on. So if you are interested in it, toss sort of a plus one into the chat. That'll give us a quick straw poll proxy of whether that's something worth going into further. But knowing how to, how to sort of structure your batching strategy is also tough. Do you send each request in real time? Do you batch them? This has impacts on your sort of inference time and your time to resolve any sort of request. So there's a lot of different options here it can be tough to figure out, especially when you're starting out and needing to shift that strategy as you get more and more mature. And then finally, training and deploying frequently. Models evolve, data continues to aggregate and grow. Your model has to be the most recent in order for it to be the most competitive, especially when it's a business critical application. For the half of you that are coming from corporations, I imagine you're doing something along the lines of forecasting or recommendation engine. These things are sort of the lifeblood of your part of the business. So I can imagine that the amount of data you're collecting, but also the need to retrain it is super, super high. Being able to redeploy those models without downtime also becomes super critical. And so for all these reasons, scaling can be super, super challenging. But throughout our day, what are we spending our time doing? Instead of spending our time building the best model, scaling it out, we are, next slide, we're fighting fires. We're trying to make sure nothing is burning down and trying to tell ourselves that everything is totally fine. But even if we put out all those fires, it breaks the bank to, in order to do this. You need a massive team. And for those of you who are working in enterprise, you can, you can sort of attribute for yourselves. You don't have a small effort. It's hard to do that when you're starting out your own product by yourself. You don't have sort of a massive team. You have to be scrappy. It's tough to do that. Next slide. This only gets harder though when you have a large model, whether it's stable diffusion or a large language model, whatever it is, it only gets tougher. And the reason for that is because, well, first of all, inference time increases exponentially. And with inference time going up, so does your cost for your servers. So does the amount of time it takes to resolve a request and therefore how, how uh, busy they are throughout the day. A thousand requests for a smaller model doesn't equate to a thousand requests for a much larger one. In order to resolve that problem, you can spin up new servers but that takes a long time too, if you can provision them at all. And then finally, the third thing that we oftentimes hear is controlling costs. I know this is a thing that's quite reductive, but controlling costs is sort of the, the thing that everything comes back to that we hear from our customers. You can mess with the dials for speed or the dial for reliability or the dial for inference and concurrence, but it's really tough to do that without considering that final readout, which is the amount of cost. So hopefully you're excited to learn a little bit more about how we did it. But before we do that, I want to hear about how you guys currently scale your APIs. So you'll see a poll pop up on your screens in a couple of seconds. And I want you to help us understand of those options, which ones have you tried? You can only select one. So maybe choose your favorite option. Um, and if it's something else, then you know, just toss it in the chat what that option actually might be. Sharon, is there one of these that you prefer? Um, mostly Qflow slash Kubernetes. Um, but yeah, it's sort of like an overkill, right? For um, I think majority of the use case. 
Um, but yeah, it essentially gives you all the belts and button to turn whatever you need. Yeah, so you must be pretty familiar with the Fed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The inner working. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, that's a disadvantage of um, using a big tool like Kubernetes. Yeah, fair enough. I imagine that just relying on a third party service is how most people would get started. Um, are there any disadvantages or any obvious reasons you wouldn't do that? It's mostly like it's a black box, right? You don't get enough control. So like, if you don't really care, um, you're a data scientist and you just wanna deploy something, then third party options or SageMaker or something like that is probably nice. Got it. Um, well, it seems like a lot of folks agree. We kind of have a, an even split between third party and something else. And then a lot of love for, uh, for Kubernetes. All right. Well, that's really helpful to hear because I think we tend to we tend to have the opinion that Sharon does, which is you can go with a third party service sort of out of the box, but super hard to manipulate. Kubernetes is really hard to work with out of the gate, but gives you a ton of potential after that. Um, next slide. And so what I wanna do is I wanna spend just a minute or two talking about sort of what Lightning AI is, because we've gotten a lot of questions in the past about the difference between Lightning AI and PyTorch Lightning. I'm gonna quickly reset my camera here because I'm clearly just putting it out of focus. But the difference between PyTorch Lightning and Lightning AI is as follows. With PyTorch Lightning, you can train a model. But with Lightning AI, in addition to training it, you can turn that into an application with a UI. So it's just that power, that supercharged platform that's behind, or that sort of above and beyond what PyTorch Lightning can do. Of course, with PyTorch Lightning, you can organize reusable code, but with Lightning AI, you can also turn the, we have a gallery of templates that are really easy to adopt, get you started fast, but you avoid that black box nature of many third-party services. So you can, because a lot of this is open source, you can jump in and make any changes that you need. And in the very near future, what we also hear is, oh, well, a lot of the dependencies weren't installed on my machine. It takes me a lot of time to get my environment set up. We've got some pretty exciting things coming in the form of not needing to do all of that locally, but being able to do so on the cloud. So if you are interested in hearing or learning a little bit more about coding on the cloud, just drop a little message into the chat and I can reach out to you guys personally afterwards. And then finally, multi-GPU training has always been one of the greatest strengths of PyTorch Lightning. That's how I first heard about it. But with Lightning AI, you can now kind of go a step further. You can leverage those cloud resources that you have and deploy your own cluster if you need to. So you have the flexibility that you know Sharon was sort of talking about, you tend to lose with some of these third-party services. The final sort of X factor is that obviously PyTorch Lightning being a framework, you're sort of restricted to PyTorch Lightning. But with Lightning AI, within the run method of any of the apps you build, you have flexibility to use whichever framework you want or even just write Python code. Really, it is your connection point to a lot of these different nodes in the ML and AI ecosystem. I say all this because right now, if you guys want to drop into lightning.ai, you have the opportunity to get three free credits, try some stuff out, including everything that Sharon is about to show you right now. So with that, let's get to the meaty juicy stuff. Sharon, show us how you did what you did. All right, so um, yeah, so we try to take this one problem of scaling large um, models, um, very large models like stable diffusion or LLM in this particular case, stable diffusion to 1K concurrent users. It's extremely hard um, because one single node can probably uh, only serve one instance and one instance prediction time, as Neil said, is gonna take a lot of time. So you need to um, have multiple machines working together and have like some sort of load balance or balancing the request. It's extremely hard to do that by hand. Um, if you wanna use something like Kubernetes, uh, you need to have the resource and skill. Um, or in the SageMaker, you don't really have the capacity to, you know, um, edit or change things as you want. So you need to work with the structure that they created. Um, what I would like to show today, I'm going to jump back to the demo that I have. Um, so, yeah, what I want to show today is 
um, in the app gallery, go to, if you go to this particular app, Auto Scale Stable Diffusion Server. Um, this is the one good example that we have made to showcase how you can do this. So here um, you can see this piece of code, which is an auto scaler component that, that you have available to download, um, import from Lightning. That takes two parameters, two types of parameters. The first set of parameters is your server um, or the component that, that basically serves the model. The second set is the arguments for auto scaling. Now, you must be asking what is this component, right? This also comes from um, this very PyTorch lightning way of doing things. So we have made this abstracted Python server class, which you can inherit from, on which you have two methods to modify or override the setup and predict. On the setup method, it basically runs only once, and then the predict method runs for every request. Um, so in the setup method, you say, we basically initialize the model, and the predict method, you configure it to uh, run for every method. So what you're passing here is this diffusion server to the autoscaler component, along with which machine type you want to use for that particular server. What I want to tell you is, uh, or what I want to stress is you don't really need an autoscaler component to serve this particular component. You can run this component by itself. It's just that it will be a single model server instance, right? By wrapping that thing with an autoscaler component, what you are enabling this thing to do is to um, use all the um, belts and buttons that comes with this autoscaler component. For example, you can define what's the min, min replica that you want, what's the max replica. Um, so something like the current use case that we are trying to define, 1K concurrent uses, you would need to have like something like 160 servers running to get optimi optimal performance. So 160 GPU machines running, you would set up min replica to be zero or max replica has to be 160 or something like that. Um, and then uh, Autoscaler takes care from there, take it from there and deploy a load balancer in front of it. And from that point onwards, just you know balance the load as, as it comes. It does order batching, it makes sure it spins down the uh, turn down the machines or spin up new machines as the request comes in, which is also a bit different from typical auto scaler things that you see. So if you want to run it today, log into Lightning, you get three free, three free credits as um, Neil said. Go here and then just duplicate, click on duplicate button will basically run your server in cloud. Um, what you get with that uh, is a stable diffusion server. But let's say you want to do a bit more, right? You can copy this, go to your editor. Uh, let's see, I already have copied that. Uh, okay, yeah, go to your editor, you paste that code. You say you want to run the inference steps for 50 times, not 30 times. You can make that change, or you can change the setup function altogether and replace that with, I don't know, let's say LLMs or uh, Open Journey, um, something like that, right? Or stable diffusion 2.0 and the predict method you again configure the predict method here is the the key thing is basically calling the predict step on the model but you can change that and once you've done that you have the diffusion server that can run by itself and then you pass that to the auto scaler you change this to zero so you don't pay for anything when there are no requests you change this to 160 so it can go up to 160 machines and you know, unexpected cost more than 160 if you get DDoSed or minus try to create or add, have more requests coming to your server. In this particular case, I put scale out interval to be zero. Scale out interval basically means how soon you want to scale out. Sometimes you get the spike, you don't want to scale out immediately. You want to wait for some time and see if that's load sustaining and only if sustaining you want to scale out. So you can basically control all this. You can go to the source code of autoscaler. And if you don't like something that we are doing in this code, um, you can change that and then use that directly. For example, the scale function, the scale logic, if you don't like how we are scaling, you can change this and it just work out of the box. Right, so that is that. Um, I'm gonna go to a terminal here um, and see. 
So I have the app.py that I just created. And the way you run is you do lightning run app app.py, right? That's it. When you do that, you're essentially going to run this on your local machine. But in this particular case, downloading stable diffusion, that setup method is going to take a while. So I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but feel free to do that if you want to experiment with it. Just by adding cloud argument to this command, you're going to run this whole thing in cloud. Uh, exactly like how you clicked on that duplicate button, what happened. But in this particular way, you essentially have the code and you, know, you can make the changes. Uh, but since this is going to take some time because you want to get the um, uh, you will have to get the code from um, uh, AWS and stuff. I have already have something running with 80 replicas. So this is the UI that we have configured, but again, it's totally up to you. If you want to have a completely different UI where you can drag image or you know have like a text box something, feel free to do that. Um, I also have a Locust server running where I have 1,000 concurrent users. Um, I'm getting about 50 requests per second. Um, this is live making requests to the stable diffusion server, thousand concurrent users together. Um, yeah, so uh, by the way, this is also a lightning app. Um, so the, the whole idea of lightning app is it gives you the flexibility to not just doing deep learning, but anything that you wanna do uh, with Python and make, let you make the apps uh, as you wish. All right, with that, I think um, um, I've given you enough idea about how an auto scalar would function. If you have questions, feel free to shoot. Uh, we can take it from them. Very cool. So Sharon, you're essentially saying that with the auto scalar recipe that we have, you can take that make the modifications you need to, to the scaling logic. Um, so that it suits whatever the use case you might have, but you can also just sort of take it out of the box, make a few changes to the arguments that are there, like the replicas or the scale up or scale down um, intervals, and you're kind of off and running. And you have something that's sort of yeah. fit for purpose, certainly up to a thousand. Maybe that's not where you're going to immediately. That's quite a bit of traffic on a daily basis. Um, yeah. But it'll even work for you have a very respectable 5,000 to 10,000 daily requests, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, thousand concurrent users is like how much, if you do that continuously for like 24 hours, that'd be like five to 10 million requests a day. So that's yeah, pretty good business, yeah. I'd say so, I'd say so. Five to 10 million a day is enviable. All right, folks. Um, well, obviously the rest of this time is yours. Uh, we're here to answer any questions that you might have. The Q&A section is the best place to drop any questions that you might have in. If you want to see something in a little bit more detail, also, by all means, request that. Whatever is reasonable, we'll address here in the whole group. Otherwise, if there are a lot of questions sort of left over, what we'll do is we'll just reach out directly to you guys as a group in a follow-up email, and we'll share any of the questions that you might have. Olya, thank you for sharing that auto the Autoscaler app. Really appreciate that. Um, if you have any questions about Lightning as well, feel free to bring those up. Um, and obviously, coming to one of these can be a little bit overwhelming to ask questions at. So if you do want to sort of reach out more personally, we should have probably included our Twitter information, huh, Sharon? Learning for next time. But you can reach out to either Sharon or I on Twitter or directly via email. We will send you guys both of those things in the chat. Ah, oh, Olia, you're magical, thank you. Um, absolutely happy to reach out. And please be, please be welcome to reach out. We're happy to answer any more questions that you might have. Um, but taking a look at the q and it doesn't seem like we have anything popping up. We'll keep everything open for a few more minutes here. But guys, thank you for attending. Thank you for participating. It's great to see everyone from San Francisco all the way over to India and Romania in between. Um, you guys are fantastic. We'll do many more of these, and I appreciate everybody stopping by.